Before we read the scripture, I'd just like to say a few things. These last eight weeks, uh, this quote from Dag Hammarskjöld, the diplomat from Norway, keeps coming to my mind. Uh, for all that has been, thanks. For all that will be, yes. Uh, today, I'm grateful for all that has been. And Kathy and I have spent the last two months saying thank you to the people of Wildwood Presbyterian Church back in Illinois uh, for all their partnership in the gospel from the first day until over these 23 years. And several of them have told me that they're going to be watching from time to time on your YouTube channel. So I thought it'd be nice if I could just do a little bit of a shout out here. <laughs> My friends back in Wildwood uh, to let you know that Kathy and I will always be grateful to you. Uh, for those 23 years and that we will always hold you right right here. But I'm also grateful for all the things that have been happening at Christ Presbyterian Church these last years. For Garrett Merrill and all the folks on the Pastor Nominating Committee who in all kinds of ways uh, showed Kathy and me that this could be a spiritual home uh, for us. Uh, for Jeremiah and Tim and the elders and deacons and teachers and leaders and everyone who has stepped up in the interim time, I know that that takes a lot. And back in Wildwood, I put a, I put a legal pad on the, the uh, island in the middle of the office and it was like stuff Craig does. And we just kept making a list of all the little things that over the years accumulates. And I know you had a list just like that here <laughs> after Doug left and uh, you stepped up and, and, and kept the mission uh, going here and kept the faith alive here, and so I'm grateful to all of you for that. And for the transition team, and for all of you who have welcomed us first from afar, and now that we have arrived right here. Uh, so to all of you, I say for all that has been, thanks. But even more today, on our first Sunday here, on the first day of our partnership in the gospel, which Paul describes in uh, his letter to the Philippians, the church that perhaps he loved the most. He says, uh, for all that, for all that will be, I say yes. You know, God told the prophet Jeremiah, you know, that other Jeremiah. <laughs> God said, I, I know the plans I have for you. Plans for good, not for evil. Plans to give you a future and a hope. And God has those same plans for us here at CBC. Plans for good, for a future, and hope. And Kathy and I are excited to be here to share those with you. So, for all that will be, yes. Now, I think the church is in the grace business. When we baptize a baby, we say, Behold what love God has for us, that we should be called children of God. Every child, whether they're eight days old or eight months old, Eight years, 80 years. That's the oldest person I've ever baptized who's 80 years old. And I told her, uh, I told her, Maxine, you have waited so long to be baptized that I'm going to use a lot of water. <laughs> she said, you better not. <laughs> I just smiled. And I did. And to this day, Maxine knows that she is baptized. It gives me a little bit of a look when I remind her about it, but it's, it's also uh, a look of grace that I receive from her when we talk about her baptism. So from the beginning, God is a part of our lives, growing that grace within us, some at different rates, but nonetheless, that's within us as God uh, grows us all uh, into his glad and faithful people. So that what makes it today a little bit hard on the second Sunday of Advent, because every year the gospel story appointed to be read on the second Sunday of Advent uh, is the same, and it's not pretty. For years, my fellow preacher, Kathy, who we usually would alternate Sundays, for years she would stick me with the second Sunday of Advent. <laughs> But this year, I've done it to myself. I said, let's start the first Sunday of December, which, of course, is the second Sunday of Advent. So I'm the one that decided my first Sunday here, the scripture story pointed to be read would be that of John the Baptist. So here it comes, John the Baptist from the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. 
Hear the word of God. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. And John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I know it's Advent, but let's be honest, we're all leaning into Christmas. I know I am. We bought a little Christmas tree yesterday. I'm hearing uh, Christmas carols in stores. I'm humming that Vince Guaraldi song myself, you know, Christmas time is here. <laughs> Christmas parties have started. We had a glorious Christmas uh, celebration here Friday night for, uh, for the women. Um, we're leaning into Christmas. And many of you, I think, could probably tell me the date and the time and maybe even the gate number where your loved ones will arrive on a plane to celebrate the Holy Day with you, or perhaps where you will be leaving to fly back east to colder climates to put in your time in the cold weather for five or six days, finish that, come back here to where the weather is glorious all the time. It's Christmas time, and I really am not enthused about hearing from this, this, this ancient person from the desert wearing camel hair, who eats honey, that's okay, and locusts, that's grasshoppers, not so okay. I'm wondering why it is that we would look for wisdom to someone such as this. Now, I feel fortunate that, uh, or I was smart enough actually not to read Matthew or Luke, because in Matthew and Luke's Gospel, uh, John tells the people he's talking to, calls them a brood of vipers. I was thinking this would be a really great way to start. <laughs> My first Sunday, to talk about us all as a bunch of snakes. Not good for job security. <laughs> so we'll stick with Mark's cleaner version. You know, you, you picture the manger story, we think of the friendly beasts gathered around the manger. You know, snakes are not present. So, so we'll leave them out of it for now. But wouldn't it be nice if John the Baptist would just sort of wait until January to talk to us about repentance? Repentance. Your repentance, you know, we, we, we know what it means. It means to be sorry for your sins, to be sorry for what you've done. But in the original languages, you know, repentance is a little more visceral than that. It's a little more physical. Because to repent means to turn. So it's not just about being sorry for what it's been. It means actually to turn, to go in a new direction, to head a new path. So when John the Baptist calls to repent, he's saying a little bit, a little bit more. Really, when, when John says repent, he's really saying begin again. Not just sorry about what has been, but begin again. Head off in a different kind of a direction. So John's invitation to repent is just that begin again. Now, one of the great themes of the Christian faith is that we can do this, begin again. That at any time, God invites us, encourages us, every once in a while, compels us to make different choices, to choose different priorities, to head in a new direction, to begin again. One of the great gifts of God is that we can do that. You know those words from Corinthians. The past is finished and gone. Everything is fresh and new. You can start again. Now some of us know that all too well. Some of us know when we look in the mirror, 
we feel the burdens of the past, of decisions we've made, things we've done or left undone, said or left unsaid. Uh, we've broken commandments, broken promises, broken people, broken ourselves through our own foolish choices, broken sometimes those closest to us by our own unawareness or our own self-centeredness. So some of us know all too well when we look in the mirror that we need to turn. We need to turn. And that's why it's good news that John offers not just repentance, but he calls us to forgiveness. Because forgiveness is the only remedy there is for a past that we cannot change. So when John the Baptist calls us to repent, for those who really, when they look in the mirror, see something they need to turn away from, that is good news. That is good news. And it's the opportunity to begin again with the past finished and gone. But for others of us, this call to repent is a little harder to get a hold of. Others of us are only vaguely aware, perhaps, that something's missing. That something in our lives isn't quite right, that all the pieces aren't in place. We know there, there ought to be something more. There has to be something more. And sometimes we're not even aware that we're looking for it. We're searching for whatever that may be. Maybe you're just going through the motions, phoning it in. And if you're phoning it in, it doesn't matter if you have an iPhone 6. It doesn't matter. If you're going through the motions, and there's something in there, there's an empty place. Or maybe, maybe you're caught up in the busyness of life, and you know, we're all busy. But there's this sense that the things you're busy with don't really make much of a difference to anyone else. Maybe don't even make much of a difference to me. And then, if that's your case, your situation, then John's call to turn to choose a new direction, to have different priorities. And that call again is good news because it's the, John's telling you, you can begin again. You can choose a new kind of a life. And then, maybe there are others. I was reading this quote from a, another pastor not long ago who said some words that were a little bit ouch. He said, he said, too often, he says, we prefer illusions about ourselves to the embarrassing truth that we're not all that holy. Too often our faith is a mostly trivial thing that's pasted on the outside of an otherwise unchanged life. And too often we envision using God to help us with our pet projects instead of letting God use us to be part of what God is doing in the world. Ouch. We prefer illusions about ourselves to the embarrassing truth that we're not all that holy, that our faith is too often a trivial thing that we sort of paste on the outside. And too often we want to use God for our pet projects rather than letting God use us to make a difference in the world. And if that's the case, then again, this call to repent, to turn, is good news indeed. There's one of the great Christmas carols, one of the top two, I think, Joy to the World, has a, a little bit of line of repentance in it, it's sort of hidden in there. They sneak it in. <laughs> Let every heart prepare him room. Let every heart prepare him room. Which recognizes, I think, that most of the time we fill our hearts with things that don't matter all that much. We fill our hearts with things that won't last. So I think let every heart prepare him room is a sort of a prayer we might adopt. Let my heart prepare him room this Christmas. Let my heart prepare him room. 
So I invite you, as part of our Advent preparation for the celebration of Christmas, to look into your heart and see what's there. What did Jesus say? Where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. See what's there. See if there's room. See if there's room for the Christ child to be born again this year. See if there is, if you don't want to use the word repent, don't use the word repent. Use the word turn. See if there's a turn you need to make. A mid-course correction. A new direction. So that your heart will prepare him room. You know, Christmas at the end is, is about a baby. And you know, everybody who's taking care of a baby, you know, a baby needs changed. <laughs> but really, more profoundly, a baby changes everyone. A baby changes mother and father, brother and sister, grandmothers, grandparents. A baby changes everyone. A baby turns your world upside down. A baby changes the way you spend your time, the way you spend your money, the way you spend your days. A baby brings sleeplessness, but also awe. Fear, but also wonder. A baby makes you vulnerable to the world in a whole different way because whatever happens to that baby that you love also in some way happens to you. A baby changes everyone. And that's true of any baby. So how much more about the child of Bethlehem? So this Advent, I invite you to look into your heart and prepare him room, to not give room in your heart to anything except that which will connect you to that peace that is beyond ourselves, to that power that comes from somewhere else, to that love that comes from the child of Bethlehem. And so I invite you to hear the invitation of the child of Bethlehem to turn your world upside down. The invitation of the child of Bethlehem to change a little bit, to make you turn a little bit about the way you spend your time, the way you spend your money, the way you spend your days. To let the child of Bethlehem perhaps give you a little bit of sleeplessness, a little fear, but also a sense of awe and wonder. To let the child of Bethlehem make you vulnerable. Vulnerable in a different way. To those whom you love and to what they experience, to those whom perhaps we cannot name and yet are out there in this world that is too full of suffering and too full of sorrow. This, this Advent, this Christmas, let your heart prepare room for the child of Bethlehem, the child who is no longer a child, but the Savior. Pray with me. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us this day. Amen.